Romans 13 again, Romans chapter 13. Pick back up this morning where we left off. I tell you, I like to preach me to death this morning. I went home and felt like I'd plowed a field with a mule. <clears throat> I might not be the best preacher in town, but I ain't nobody has more fun preaching than I do, especially here. I love preaching at Calvary Baptist Church, and uh, y'all are such a receptive group of people, and uh, it makes it hard to find a place to cut off. I, I, actually, I saw, uh, I saw today where uh, T.D. Jakes has a, a message. He just preached an hour and 40 minutes. I said, man, I'm shortchanging our people. I got to do better. I could almost hear some of y'all looking at your watch when I said that. I could almost hear it. Hour and four. T.D. Jakes, hour and 40 minute message. Of course, you've got somebody on the organ going zip, zip. He'd say, mm, he'd preach a little bit and it'd go zip, zip. If Miss Hope could get on that organ, I believe I could get another, I believe I could get another hour out of this 40 minute message right here. But you got to get that zip, zip. Well, <clears throat> Romans 13, are you there? Stand with me, please. Romans chapter 13, verse 11. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness and not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. We'll pick back up tonight with that message on the urgency of the hour. Father, help us now, I pray, as we continue this thought, continue working in our hearts. Give us <clears throat> liberty to listen and may the Holy Spirit have liberty to work. And what I feel like tonight, there's a couple of really important truths that you want us to, 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 to study and to listen to and learn. And I pray that you would do that for us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for standing. You can be seated. <clears throat> this morning we looked at this, it was our, our text we looked at quite a few verses, and we'll do that tonight, some more verses. But we just kind of launched out of this, this chapter where the Apostle Paul, he says in verse 11, that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. When he talked about our salvation, I don't believe he's talking about the, the, the act of salvation or the working of salvation. I think he's talking about the redemptive aspects of salvation that comes with the rapture the, uh, when, when, we're, when we're called up and when we're changed. I believe he was looking for the Lord to come back. He was looking for Jesus to come back. And this was 2,000 years ago. And I thought about this this afternoon. I wonder what the Apostle Paul would have said if somebody had walked up to him and said, Paul, you do know it's going to be a couple thousand more years before Jesus comes back. He probably would have called him a heretic. He literally believed Jesus was coming back. The early church, read the book of Acts, they thought Jesus was coming back. They were selling their land. They were selling their houses. They were bringing money, giving it to the church and giving it to people in the church that had needs because they literally thought Jesus would come back any minute. Why? Because he said on that mountain, the same way you've seen me go, I'm coming back in like manner. They thought they would see him come back in their lifetime. And I was thinking about it this afternoon. I wonder why Jesus said it that way. I wonder why so many places in the Bible talks about looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. John the Revelator said, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. And I believe Jesus did not tell us when he was coming back because he wanted the child of God to live in a perpetual state of urgency. And it's not working with some people. They're still asleep. They're still uh, uh, oblivious to the times. But just, just be honest. If 2,000 years ago they thought Jesus was coming back and Paul said, uh, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. How much more should we today have that sense of urgency? Even in the book of Hebrews, it says not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together is the manner of some is, but so much the more as we see the day approaching. They thought Jesus was coming back. Or the church had church every day. People were getting saved and baptized and joining the church every day. There was a sense of urgency. Here we are now in 2022. 
I'm afraid there are a lot of God's people. There are a lot of church members that are like the lost, that scoff and mock. Where's the promise of his coming? Where's the promise of his coming? I mentioned it this morning. I used to sit in church all my life, sit in camp meeting, hear preachers get up, preach on the rapture. Man, you're waiting for, you, I'd look at the ceiling. I'd look at the ceiling. Man, I hope I don't hit that beam right there when I go up. I'm being honest. I said at Faith Baptist Camp, they had those big old metal beams. I was like, man, I don't want to be sitting under that thing when the rapture takes place. That hurt to hit that thing. As a kid, I'm thinking, man, the rapture's going to, y'all follow me. The rapture's going to take place. I'm going going out of here. Right here, right now. I mean, I could just almost, I was almost like waiting to go up. The anticipation of the rapture. I believe he wants us to live that way. In fact, there is a special crown for those who love his appearing. What does it mean to love his appearing? You say, well, I'm really, Lord, hope the Lord Jesus comes back. I believe that will be reflected in the life we live. Sure right. Our life will reflect our true belief that Jesus could come back anytime. Now, there's a group of people that don't believe in the imminent return. They believe Jesus is going to return halfway through the seven-year tribulation period. There's a group of people that believe Jesus won't come back till after the seven-year tribulation period. Well, they're welcome to stay as long as they want to, but I'm going out before the rapture. Yeah. And you can stay as long as you want to. I'm going out before the rapture. I'm going out when the rapture before the tribulation period. I believe in the imminent return. I believe he could come back right now. Nowhere did he tell us to look for the Antichrist. He told us to look for Jesus. Right, right, right. Amen. I'm not looking for the Antichrist. People ask me all the time, who do you think it's going to be? What's it going to look like? I don't know. I'm not going to be here. Right. Amen. Amen. He'll be revealed after we're gone. I'm looking for Jesus to come back. I believe if we really believed Jesus was coming back at any minute, we would live with a sense of urgency. There would not be a complacency. There would be no room for laziness or slothfulness in the life of the believer. So I won't repeat everything I preached this morning, but in our text, we looked at knowing the time. Now it's high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light, and we see the urgency of the hour in the ministry and the life of the Apostle Paul. This morning we looked at the first point in the message was the urgency of the hour calls for faith in the Savior. I won't repeat the, that part of the message, but I believe that those that have not been saved, have not been truly born again, is running out of time to get saved. You say, well, can't they get saved? If they're not saved, they could get saved during the tribulation period. I wouldn't bet on that if I was you. You take, all the, you take all the Christians out of here, take all the preachers out of here, take all the spirit-filled believers out of here. If you don't get saved now, you're going to have a hard time getting saved in the tribulation period. I'm not saying you can't. A lot of them will get saved, but it's going to be people never heard. I don't want to get distracted, but I'm saying this. Some of y'all some of y'all are banking, if you hadn't been saved, you say, I'm going to get saved next week, I'm going to get saved later. You don't know that. You know, a sense of urgency. You better get saved right now. I wouldn't even wait to end this message. If I was lost, I'd run down the aisle right now. I'd fall down at the feet of Jesus and get saved right now if I thought I wasn't saved. The faith in the Savior. Secondly, we looked at fervency in service and looked at how that there's people around us that have needs. People around us hurting. People around us that need what we have. And it really impressed me as I thought about Abraham. We looked at that story in Abraham in the book of Genesis. The Bible says he was a wealthy man, had a lot of gold, had a lot of silver. He was a filthy rich. He could have paid somebody to do all that, but he did himself. Why? Because he had a heart, a heart for service and a heart for ministry. And I don't know, but what one of the most impressive parts of that story, and if I turn over there, I'm going to get distracted. So I'm going to turn over there. But it's in Genesis 18, I believe it was, where after he ran and fetched that calf, and then he had to skin it, then he had to butcher it. Then he had to grill it. And then he served it. And the Bible says he stood there. He was the waiter after he did all that. He took their order. Come on now. Took their order, went and caught it, cooked it, brought it to them, and then he stood there and waited on them. I mean, you're talking about a heart for service and a heart for ministry. What about that? Fervency. And we looked at the times where he ran, hurrying, hurrying, hastening, hurrying. The people around us have needs. Right. Thirdly, this morning, this evening, let's pick back up with number three. The urgency of the hour calls for following the scripture. Amen. I want you to just, you can lose your place in Romans. I want you to turn over to Psalm right quick. I want to show you something. Psalm 
Psalm 119. Psalm 119. I want to show you something. I love this chapter. It's about the Word of God. I refer to it often. I say, preacher, you've been preaching a lot about the Word of God. I know. I can't help it. I love the Bible. I love the Bible. You can't hardly, you can't hardly repeat too much obeying the Bible. If we'd do that, we'd be in good shape, wouldn't we? Huh? Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his ways by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Solve our problems if we'd live by this Bible. Psalm 119, verse number 60. I made haste. I made haste, David said, and delayed not to keep thy commandments. The minute I heard it, the minute truth was revealed, the minute the word of God was revealed to me, I delayed not. I made haste to keep the commandments. Boy, what a testimony. Look at verse 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now have I kept thy word. Well, that's a good verse. The urgency of the hour calls for us to follow the scriptures. Heed the voice of of God. I made the statement this morning that for us, for the child of God, waiting on God is a sign of spirituality. That's what James tells us. Let patience have a perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. A sign of true maturity, spirituality in a believer is patience, learning to wait on God. Waiting on God is patience, but God having to wait on us, that's just pathetic. As much as God has done for us, and as much as he has for us, for him to have to wait on us to obey and to comply and to do what he said, it's just pathetic. In fact, don't turn over there because I'll get distracted. I got so many rabbits running up here. If I shoot them all, I'm gonna run out of ammo. Mark chapter number one was the chapter we was in this morning. And I was looking at Mark chapter number one as we talked about uh, the ministry and the work ethic of the Lord Jesus. And I just was looking through there at the disciples. Here was two disciples in verse number uh, 17, 18, 19, 20. Straightway, immediately they followed him. The Bible tells us uh, that he spoke to the unclean spirits and the unclean uh, the, 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 the demons in verse number 25 and verse number 26. And immediately they obeyed his voice. In verse number 31, he spoke to the woman that was sick. Simon's wife's mother lay sick, took her by the hand, lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her. All these indications, the, the waves and the winds obeyed his voice. The demons obeyed his voice immediately. Even the fever left immediately. But those of us that are saved, he has to tell us over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And the burden on my heart tonight is the urgency of the hour calls for us to follow the scriptures, listen to the voice of God. We've been blessed to have his word. Right. People all over the world don't know what God said. They don't have access to the truths. 6,000 language groups still do not have a Bible in their language. And we have the word of God, the complete, inspired, infallible, and errant word of God, the heart of God, the mind of God. We have it. He's told us what he wants us to do. The urgency of the hour calls for us to heed that and listen to him. There's too much procrastination in the life of many Christians once truth has been revealed. How many times do you need to hear it before you will do it? No need to think about it. No need to pray about it. Just do it. Once God shows you, do it. Once he speaks, obey. He shouldn't have to repeat himself. He shouldn't have to beg or plead the child of God to obey him. He should speak, and we should obey. In Matthew chapter number four, I'm going to show you something. Matthew chapter number four. Turn over there right quick. You want to talk about immediate obedience. You want to talk about responding immediately, immediately to the voice of God. Matthew chapter number four. Verse 18, Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. They didn't even go home and get a shower. 
And as I was reading that verse, they, cast their, they were casting their nets. And he said, follow me. And the Bible says they left their nets. And it occurred to me, I don't think this is going out on a limb, there's a possibility they just left that net in the water. There's a pretty good chance they didn't even draw the net. I'm just saying there's a good chance. They're throwing this net. Jesus says, follow me. Immediately in their heart, there was something that compelled them to go and follow him. Why draw the net? They're not going to clean the fish. They're not going to haul them out of there. They're not going to take them to the market. They're not going to sell them. And they're not going to make any money off of them. Might as well just leave them in the ocean. And they left their nets probably. I'm saying they threw their nets and he said, follow me. And they left their nets. Just walked away from it. I'm saying there's a good chance they left that net in the water. Didn't even draw it. Let's keep reading. And going on from thence, verse 21, he saw other two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them, and they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. What a picture. They're sitting there working. They're mending their nets. They're pursuing their lifelong career. It's got a family endeavor, a family business. They're working together as brothers. They're working with their father. They're on this ship. They're mending their nets. Jesus says, come, follow me. They left the nets, left the boat, left daddy, kissed him goodbye, and they left and followed Jesus. The Bible says immediately. And him a complete stranger. Let's be honest, they didn't know anything about him. Chances are good they had never seen him perform a miracle. They had never heard him preach a message. Here's a complete stranger says, come follow me. Something inside of them said, go, follow. Leave your nets, leave your job, leave your career. Don't worry about your bills. Don't worry about your finances. Don't worry about your 401k. You just walk away from everything and go with him. And they did it and they did it immediately. Fast forward to 2022. God says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to follow me. We drag our feet, lollygag around, think about it, mull it over. And I'm going to tell you what we're doing. We're trying to talk ourselves out of following him. That's what we're doing. We're trying to talk ourselves out of being obedient. What a statement. What a statement. I wonder how much more God would tell us if he'd have to tell us everything 10 or 15 times. I wonder how much more we could do for God if we didn't spend six months praying about, thinking about, trying to decide whether or not we were going to do what he told us to do six months ago. Where would we be in our spiritual life? How far along would we be if every time he showed us light, we just walked in that light? Every time he gave us truth, we just accepted that truth. Every time he gave us a nudge, we responded. And every time he moved and guided us in our life, we allowed him to do that. I wonder how far in our spiritual walk we would be at this point. I'm afraid that we're, we're like the little stiff-legged kid that don't want to go to school when mama's trying to push him in the door trying to do what God wants us to do. But we don't trust him. We won't follow him. We won't respond to his voice. The Bible's clear. Their, 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 their response was immediately. I looked it up in the Greek. It means pronto. I'm just kidding. It means right now. Right now. Immediately. Straightway. Without delay. Imagine if the Christian life, imagine if the Christian life would immediately, if we would immediately, immediately, Respond to his voice every time. Jesus made one statement. Preachers can preach a message for 45 minutes and we still argue with God about it. And use 57 different Bible verses. Oh, I don't know about that. I don't think that applies to me. Well, I hadn't seen it that way. Well, God hadn't convicted me of that. Well, your convictor might be broke. Oh, I'd like to have a dollar for every time somebody said, well, God hadn't convicted me of that. Well, I tell you what you do. You show me in a Bible verse where he's got to convict you of everything he already said for you to do, and then you'll probably get a hall pass, but it ain't in there. It's not in there that we have to be convicted to do what he's already told us to do. We 
We see the following of Scripture. It's urgent. It's urgent. Listen now. Obey now. Do it now. Trust God now. Number four. You, are you still in Psalm 119? Turn back to Psalm 116. The urgency of the hour, number four, calls for fulfilling the sacrifice that you've already pledged to give. Look at this, Psalm 116. Won't you see this? Psalm 116, verse 14. The psalmist said, I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all of his people. Well, that's pretty good. David thought it was pretty good too because he said it again in verse 18. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of of all of his people. Twice in the same chapter, the psalmist said the same thing. It was purposed. I will pay my vows unto God. It was prompt. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now. And it was public. I will pay my vows now in the presence of all of his people. Can I tell you something tonight? Some of y'all are running out of time to make good on some of the vows you made to God Amen. down here at this altar. Amen. Right. We're quick to get an altar and make God all these promises and all these pledges. Lord, I'm going to do this. And Lord, I'm going to do this. I'm going to give you this. I'm going to give you this part of my life. I'm going to give you this aspect of my life. Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make the sacrifice. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to please you. I make all these vows and then you go back home and you forget about it. You run out of time. We had Operation Saturation about five years ago. Some of you said, I can't do it this year. Next time we do it, I'll do it. Well, we're doing it now. We're doing Operation Saturation again, five years later. Feel how quiet it just got? I'll, I'll, I'll do next. I'll give the next special offering. I, I'll, I'll come to the next event. I, I'll, I'll do this. I, I'll do that. Well, you're running out of time. When are you going to make good on your vows? Because we're the world's worst at making vows and commitments and then forgetting about them. In Jonah chapter number two, Jonah spent three days in the Belly of the whale, I almost said the belly of the whale. In the belly of the whale. Three days, that's a lot of time to reflect. A lot of time to think. You know what Jonah said, Jonah chapter number two? I'm gonna paraphrase. Lord, if you'll get me out of here. If you'll get me out of here, I will pay the vows that, I have, that I've made. That's Jonah chapter two, verse nine. I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving, I will pay that that I have vowed. Oh, Jonah, you made some vows to God and you didn't pay them? Hmm. He said, Lord, if you'll get me out of here. Those vows I forgot about, those pledges I made, I'll pay them. But you've got to get me out of here. What am I saying? I'm saying you're running out of time to make good on the promises you've made to God. I bet he was aggravated with himself for delaying and procrastinating. Some of you have made vows to God. You're yet to keep them. You've promised God you're going to give him this and give him that and do this and do that. Hey, when are you going to do it? When are you going to do it? Got quiet, didn't it? Lord speaks to us. We go to the altar. Lord, I'm going to do this. I'm going to read my Bible every day. Are you? I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray more. Are you? I'm going to start tithing. Are you? I'm going to start giving the missions. Are you? I'm going to be a soul winner. Are you? Because you're running out of time. I, I don't think we understand really how patient God has to be with us Amen. to put up with us. Long-suffering. Yeah. Yes, 
How would you feel if somebody told you something they was going to do something for you over and over and over and they never did it? Urgency of the hour. Fulfilling the sacrifice. Lord, I'm going to live for you. I'm going to serve you. Okay. Start now. Don't wait till tomorrow. Start tonight. Number five. Ecclesiastes 12. Let me read the verse first. You're right there close to it. Turn to your right a couple books. Ecclesiastes. We preach to these young ones a little bit. Ecclesiastes 12, verse number one. The urgency, the hour, number five, calls for us focusing on the sovereign. Look at the verse. Remember now thy creator. I'm in Ecclesiastes 12, 1. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. While the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. With my burden on my heart tonight for our young people. That word remember in verse number 12. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. That word remember means to be mindful. It means to mention. It means to record. It means to bring to remembrance. He's talking to the young people here. There's no greater time for you to focus on God and your creator than when you're in your youth. Listen to me, young people. The devil will do all he can to get you to remember a lot of things and focus on anything and everything but God in your youth. But now is the time. The sense of urgency of the hour is for you in your youth to focus on God and remember your creator now. Now. There's no better opportunity for you to focus on God than right now. Rachel, you just don't understand. Being a young person is hard. The hardest thing you're going to do this week is tote your book bag up those stairs when you go to your classroom. That's the hardest thing you're going to do this week. And I love y'all, but you don't know what hard is. I'm not talking down to you. I'm just getting honest. Adulting is hard. Can I get a witness? The bed you're sleeping in was bought and paid for by somebody else. The house you sleep in, that cold air that blows through them vents, them little holes in the ceiling, that cold air, somebody else is paying for that. That vehicle that brings you to school and drops you off in the morning, somebody else bought and paid for that. And the insurance, and the tags and the registration, you got it made in the shade. The clothes you're wearing, 90% of you, your mom and daddy bought you clothes. They bought your books. They pay your tuition. And when you get a little bit of money, you get to blow it on Mountain Dew and Doritos. You get to spend it on video games. And when your mom and daddy get money, they got to buy stuff for you. Now's the time when you're young to focus on God. You've got very little distractions right now. No better time to focus on God than right now. Remember now thy creator. Is that what your Bible says? He didn't say anything about remembering that boy's name he met at the gas station. He didn't say anything about remembering your login password for your TikTok account. He didn't say anything about you remember to get a girlfriend. No, he didn't say anything about focusing on your love life. He said for you to remember your creator and remember him now. Now's the time. Some of y'all looking for a boyfriend or girlfriend, you can't even make your bed up. And some of you girls are looking for a husband, you need to quit looking for a husband. The Bible says, he that findeth a wife, findeth a good thing. He's the one supposed to be doing the finding, not you. You just get right with God and you walk with God and you still live holy and you stay clean and you stay pure and you quit throwing yourself at all these other boys. God will bring you one when you're ready. You say, well, I'm ready right now. No, you ain't. You wouldn't know what to do with it if you caught it. Dogs chase cars, but they can't drive. I want a man. Clothes are laying all over the floor. 
bedroom was like a hog pen? What kind of wife do you think you'd be? Focus on baking bread, praise God. Learn how to cook. Learn how to clean house. Amen. Getting quiet. Well, we'll just eat takeout. You've got a lot to learn, ma'am. Way to a man's heart's through his stomach. Well, get off these dating websites. Let God bring you one. You'll find just about anything and everything on them stinking dating websites. He'll throw a picture up there and he's got abs. He's got his tank top on and muscles everywhere. That ain't even him. That ain't even him. You meet him, he looks like the Pillsbury Doughboy. That ain't even him. <laughs> girls putting their picture and profiles up there and they do that little... <laughs> they got their little selfie and they do that little trout pout. <laughs> Stick their honey out in the air and take their picture. God ain't in that mess. <laughs> trolling, that's what you're doing, you're trolling. You'll settle for whatever you can catch. Come on. Oh, he looked at me like I was the most beautiful thing in the world. He looks at every girl like that till he gets what he wants. He'll dump you and leave you on the side of the road with a broke heart. And many times an unwanted baby. I'm telling you right now, remember, now thy creator in the days of thy youth. We need a group of young people to learn to focus on God and focus on God now when their hearts are tender. Focus on God when, while your body is changing, while your heart and your mind is growing and developing, when your mind is fresh. Remember now thy creator. Yeah, right. Remember thy creator now when your life is unscarred and uncluttered with the things of the world. Yeah. Remember your creator now while you still have your virtue and your purity and your clean yeah. and your innocent. Yeah. Remember now thy creator Amen. in the days of thy youth. I'm grateful to have grown up under solid Bible preaching. I'm grateful to have grown up under men of God that didn't pull punches with me. Of course, I liked it strong. I liked it straight. The stronger and the straighter, the better I liked it. I've always hated weak preaching. I've always hated watered down preaching. I was born in the fire. Smoke bothers me. I like the real deal. Amen. Amen. The real deal. You just tell me straight what God wants me to do. You tell me straight what I need to do. I can handle it. Tell me what God said. Tell me what the Bible says. Young people, learn to love straight, honest, straightforward, true preaching now. And when you get older, you'll still like it. Some of these old people, they start fidgeting. Oh my goodness, I can't believe he went there. And these kids are just writing down everything I'm saying. Don't let that change. Don't let that change. That's why I like our young people down here in the front. That way you're not distracted by all the old people that are miserable while I'm preaching. <laughs> Mom and daddy, they're flinching. They're cringing like, oh my goodness, I hope my kids don't get offended. They ain't gonna get offended. You will for they do. They'll get offended for you. They'll, you'll get mad and leave for they will. They like it. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. I am a product, 49 years old. I'm where I'm at today by the truths that was instilled and drilled into me when I was a teenager. My wife's where she's at today. We've got the family that we've got. We've got the marriage that we've got. We've got the ministry that we've got because we were drilled when we were young people to remember our creator. And by the way, he is your creator. He's not some pie in the sky, some old man on a rocking chair somewhere. He's your creator. And when he said, remember now thy creator, he said that like that for a reason because he wanted you, first of all, to remember his person. Who are we talking about? We're talking about the creator of the universe. That's who we're talking about. He wanted you to recognize his power. We're talking about the one that spoke the worlds into existence. Remember him. And he wanted you to remember his plan. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. 
And God puts you here for a reason. Your mom and daddy might not know what that is, but God's got a plan for your life. And some of you, if you ever understand just how big a plan God has for your life, you will hang on every word he says so that when he tells you his plan, you'll know. You'll know. How old was you when God started dealing with you about the Philippines, Brother Nathan? 18? How old was you when you surrendered to preach? 16. 16 years old. When God started dealing with him about preaching. 18 years old when God burdened him for the country of the Philippines. He's done been over there three or four times. And now he's fixing to take his wife and his baby and move over there and be a missionary over there. It started when he was a young man. God started dealing with me about preaching when I was in fourth grade. Fourth grade. <laughs> we got a book in the, in the bookstore called Fourth Grade. Some of your parents haven't read that yet. You need to read that. Fourth grade. That age right there, that nine, nine, ten years old, that is one of the most pivotal stages in a person's life right there. And that's where I was at when God began to first came to me and spoke to me about preaching. Fourth grade. Daddy said, Stacy, I wouldn't worry about that right now. You just, you live for God and you serve God. God wants you to preach. He knows where you're at. He'll come back to you. And I'll be dogged if he didn't. He did. He came back to me. But you know what I did from the time I was in fourth grade to the time God called me to preach? I memorized as many Bible verses as I possibly could. Whole chapters. I was preparing for the ministry before God even called me into the ministry. I was going to all night prayer meetings. Boys, listen to me. I was going to all night prayer meetings when I was 15 years old. All night prayer meetings. Did I pray all night? No, I did not. But I went. There ain't, a 15, there ain't a 15 year old on the planet that's going to pray all night. There ain't too many adults will do it. But give me some credit because I wanted to. How many of y'all ever been to an all night prayer meeting? Brother Tim, you're shaking your head. I know you have. Brother Sammy Allen, they had that stuff all the time. All night prayer meeting. And them boys would pray on up to 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. And I'd just lay there and listen to them. And I said, Lord, I hope me listening to them counts a little bit toward me praying. I done run out of stuff to pray for, but it's still praying. I'm laying on the floor in the dark under a pew somewhere seeking God. 14, 15 years old. I wanted God so bad. I wanted God's hand on me so bad. I was willing to lose sleep to get it. And by the way, there wasn't too many of my youth group in that all night prayer meeting. You play video games till 3 o'clock in the morning, but praying till 3 o'clock in the morning, preacher, that's just crazy. I know, I know. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. We got young people playing video games right now while I'm preaching. It's going to get real one day when they stand before God. And they were sitting in this church, in this service, playing on their stupid phone while the man of God was preaching. I'd be afraid God strike me dead. Amen. Amen. I, God would strike me dead if I did that. The fact that he ain't struck you dead might not be saved. Right. Serious business. It just got quiet, didn't it? Yeah. Some of the stuff I have to look at while I'm preaching. Playing on your stupid phone while I'm up here preaching about, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. Yeah. Remember your creator while you're young. While you can still... Do what God wants you to do. Yes, sir. I hear it all the time. Brother Berner hears it all the time. He works with our senior citizens all the time. Preacher, I just wished I could do what I used to could. I wished I could do. I wished I could. I just can't. For some of them, just to get up and get to church, it's an accomplishment. Right to get up and get dressed, it's an accomplishment physically. To get to church. Bless their hearts. Some of them can't even figure out how to stream it. 
We have to go to their house and show them how to stream it. Touch that button right there. Turn that on. There you go. There you go. They're getting old. Losing their, their faculties. Their body is just not responding. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. Amen. Breaks my heart to see young people grow up in church, grow up in Christian school, graduate from Christian school, walk across this platform, get their diploma, and walk straight over, jump the fence, and go into the world. Breaks my heart. Well, if I could just if I could just live to be 16, get my driver's license. I could just live to be 18. If I could just be 21, if I could just get married, if I could just, if I could just, if I could just, why don't you remember your creator now? Now. Lord, I pray that you'd help us tonight. The sense of urgency. Lord, the need around us is so great. May God's people, may our young people, our teenagers, boys and girls tonight, Lord, may they understand there's never a better time to go all in with God. It'll never be easier than it is right now. It'll never be sweeter and greater and with as little peer pressure and pushback and difficulty as it is right now. It'll never be easier than it is right now.